This is a production of Cornell University Library. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mary. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, appreciate all of you coming. Uh, so thanks for, for taking the time. It's a real honor to speak to all of you here today. Um, hopefully, um, it'll be a little bit interesting. So before I go on, I just want to start by acknowledging some people in the lab, which is good I did, because a couple of them showed up. Um, <laughs> uh, and because really, these are the people who do all the work. We have great collaborators here on the Cornell campus, all over the world, in fact. Uh, and really, the, the reason I can give hopefully interesting talks is because they do all the interesting work. So what I'll do for the next few minutes is tell you about a few things. I'll tell you a little bit about fruit. Uh, what is a fruit? Uh, a little bit about tomatoes, probably a lot about tomatoes, probably so much about tomatoes you'll be sick of tomatoes by the time I'm done. Uh, but hopefully give you some perspective on some of the things that have happened in the production uh, of tomato over the years and, and why what we see in the supermarket is what is there now uh, and what are maybe some of the prospects for the future. So let me begin just a little bit with a couple of pictures whoops, of some fruits and vegetables, or at least things we call vegetables. So botanically, a fruit is uh, typically derived from a f uh, floral tissue, and it contains a seed. So if you're eating something with seeds, you're eating a fruit. Um, although, if you look at my pictures here, some of these vegetables actually have seeds, cucumbers, peppers. These are things that culturally we use as vegetables. We call them vegetables for that reason. But in fact, botanically, they're fruits. Some of our fruits, you may recognize, like bananas, don't have any seeds in them. These are mutants. They're so-called parthenocarpic fruits. They have no seed. They've been selected because we don't like eating seeds, typically, uh, or in many cases. And, but they're maintained vegetatively. You can't grow them from seed because there's no seed to grow. Um, so we tend to try and generate and identify those kinds of mutants typically in the citrus and the grapes, you're familiar with seedless. And there's probably a lot of other fruits that you wish were seedless. And people are probably trying to get the seeds out of them. <clears throat> OK. We work in our laboratory on tomato. And that'll be the focus of what I talk about. There's a couple of reasons. I'll get to some of those as I go along. One is because it's an important crop. It's about $3 billion at the farm gate before any processing in the US. About half of that is processed. So that's your tomato sauce, tomato paste, all that kind of stuff. And about half is fresh market. Um, a lot of interesting things happen as that tomato matures. And that's really the emphasis of what our laboratory focuses on. And think about what a plant does compared to you, the challenges. You have a challenge. It's too hot. It's too cold. There's a threat. What do you do? You move. right? Plants don't do that. They're stuck. So they have to respond. They typically respond chemically. So plants are the biggest producers of different compounds of chemicals. A lot of these are in our pharmaceuticals. Some of them are to resist things like pathogen attack or uh, being eaten by something uh, that's trying to uh, consume that plant. But a fruit suddenly does everything different. It suddenly goes through a program that says, eat me. And why? because it's a mechanism of dispersing seeds. That's what a fleshy fruit is all about, being consumed by something that's going to disperse the seeds somewhere else. <clears throat> and so that process of becoming attractive and desirable to something that's going to consume it typically involves conversion of starch to sugars, change in texture, getting soft, uh, a better mouth feel, becoming attractive. So often going from a photosynthetic green tissue to a brightly colored tissue. A tomato is a good example of that. In this case, accumulating carotenoids, uh, compounds like lycopene and beta carotene that have nutritional value. And interestingly, some of those nice aromas are actually derived from those nutritional compounds. So they're attractive to us. We go to consume them. But really, they're signaling, I'm good for you. I've got some uh, important nutrients in me. And something important to keep in mind is ripe fruits typically rot. You think about, for example, if you grow a tomato plant, you rarely see a rotten fruit on that plant. But once they get ripe, they start rotting. And that's really escape plan B for the, for the seeds. If something doesn't come along and consume it, 
you want to get those seeds out of there, or the plant wants to get those seeds out of there. And so that's part of the genetic program of ripening, is becoming susceptible to opportunistic pathogens that will liberate the seeds from the fruit. There's two general types of tomatoes you're probably familiar with processing, the, typically the Roma types of tomatoes, and fresh market. So these are the small cherries, the intermediate salads, the slicing types. Although you've probably noticed if you've been shopping for more than 10 years or so that we now see Romas in the supermarket. And that's because the fresh varieties have been reducing in quality to where these that are typically not considered good fresh market varieties can compete because it's easier to compete with some of the poor quality, high production varieties that are out there today. <clears throat> now what happened to tomato? If you uh, are interested in tomato and know about heirlooms, you know there's a lot of variability that you, uh, at least until recently, didn't see a whole lot in the supermarket. Now you're starting to see it come back because the seed producers, the growers realize there's a market for improved quality. Uh, and I'll get into why that is in just a minute. Uh, but really after um, you know, observations of hybrid vigor and, and the, the green revolution where people realized that if you hybridized uh, different members of a species, you'd get higher yield, higher productivity. People began doing that with tomato as well and generated hybrids that were very productive and allowed the localization, the centralization of production, very high volume production. So the California and Florida really became the tomato producers of the whole country. Once you do that, though, you've got to be able to ship to the rest of the country. You've got to have shelf life. You've got to have firmness that will allow the rigors of transport. When the fresh tomatoes are not being produced in Florida, where they're primarily produced, we're getting them from overseas, from Mexico, even from Canada and the greenhouse industry, even from Europe. So there's a lot of incentive to control shelf life and a lot of selection for production and often a lot of loss of some of these interesting characteristics that we find in some of the older heirloom types. But you're starting to see them come back a little bit, some of these traits. If you go to Wegmans, if you're from out of town, I know all of you will go to Wegmans before you leave. So stop by the tomato section and you know, unless you're a very recent graduate, you'll probably remember that there wasn't nearly the variety of tomato that you see in the supermarket now. And that's really driven by the fact that consumers are both interested in and willing to pay for better quality. And so there's much more variety of, of flavors, of colors, of shapes. There's some tomatoes back here in the back of the room that are from Wegmans. And you see these kind of you know, variety packs of different types of tomatoes that are becoming much more popular. And if you notice the prices, you're paying a premium price for those as well. And that's why the producers are putting them out there, because they know that you will. <clears throat> a little history of tomato. Where does it come from? The center of origin is in northwestern South America, Peru, Ecuador, the Galapagos Islands. That's where you'll find wild tomatoes. The Spanish explorer Hernan Cortez uh, in the 1500s came to explore and actually conquered Mexico. Uh, and typical of the European explorers, he brought back interesting stuff. So one of those interesting things was tomatoes. You think of something like Italian food. You always think of tomatoes, tomato sauce, tomato on pasta. None of that was in Italy before the 1500s, 1600s when some of this stuff started going back. And actually Naples, that part of Italy, was actually part of Spain and that's where some of those products started being used. But what did he bring back? These are some of the wild species of tomato. He didn't bring those back. He brought back tomatoes that look a lot like the cultivated tomatoes that we see in the supermarket today. So actually, the indigenous people in Central and South America were cultivating tomato. They selected for the traits that we associate with, um, with um, the modern tomato, particularly big size, a lot of production in the plant. These guys are all basically little marbles. Some of them are kind of hairy. Some of them are pretty ugly, uh, at least in terms of thinking about eating. This is the actual wild progenitor of the cultivated tomatoes. It's called Solanum pipinellifolium. 
Maybe you've had them. They're often called currant tomatoes. You'll get them in fancy restaurants sometimes. Very sweet, very tasty, but tiny, tiny, tiny little fruit. Nothing like the large fruit that you'll uh, uh, normally associate with a modern, modern tomato. And how do we know what he brought back? Well, people drew pictures. So not long after uh, Cortez returned uh, to Spain in the uh, mid early to mid 1500s, there were drawings of tomatoes that look a lot like the big tomatoes that we see now. So these had been developed, domesticated in the Americas uh, uh, prior to their introduction into Europe. <clears throat> the types of things that were selected for, the so-called domestication traits, were again really size. And it's interesting, if you think of a small tomato, you cut it in half, it's really two uh, sections, two locules. The large fruit have a lot of these locules, and they're really just compound fruit. That was one of the selection domestication traits that was selected for getting large fruit. And also these compound or uh, highly br branched inflorescence that give you a lot of fruit. So big fruit, a lot of fruit, those are the kind of things that people are going to naturally select for um, uh, in the process of domestication. More recently, we look at other traits that have been introduced into a lot of varieties. This is called jointless. So a normal tomato has this little stem that connects the fruit to the main plant called the pedicel. That pedicel has a, what's called an abscission zone, a point where it separates from the plant. It's this little knuckle-looking thing that you see here. You see it probably in some of the heirloom varieties if you ever grow them. There's a mutation called jointless that doesn't produce that, and that's bred into virtually all production varieties. Why? This looks nice. So if you see a picture of tomatoes, you'll see that, right? Let's show the, the calyx associated with it. But practically, you don't want that little stem sitting on every tomato that's in the back of a truck rolling across the country, punching into all its neighbors. So by the time you get to the end of the road, you're salsa at best. Um, so, so that's something that is, is bred into most uh, major production varieties. There's also a trait called uh, determinancy. Typical tomatoes, including the wild species, are indeterminate, meaning they'll keep producing flowers and fruit, as long as you can keep the plant alive. That's good in a greenhouse production system where your goal is to keep harvesting over a growing period. And often, if you can see this picture here, these are the stems of the plants that as a crop of fruit is harvested, it's pulled down, and then the plant's allowed to keep growing up a, a trellis. If you're growing processing tomatoes that you're going to harvest all at once, you want the fruit to make, the plant to make a bunch of fruit, be done with it, ripen all together, and then go in and harvest the whole thing mechanically. And so these determinant varieties, which again is a mutation that's been selected for a lot of the processing uh, tomatoes, is, is uh, an important characteristic to have in the genetic background. So what's happened with tomatoes? Why don't they taste as good, right? Everybody else says, oh, tomatoes don't taste as good. They don't really taste bad. If they tasted bad, you wouldn't eat them, right? So they don't taste like anything. They look good, you cut them up, you put them in your salad, you cover it with ranch dressing. It doesn't matter what they taste like, as long as they don't taste bad. But, and, th and it's important to keep in mind that what's happened with tomatoes actually happens with a lot of our fruit. We're producing it in localized areas and very efficiently, big production, and then transporting it around. We need to control that ripening process to, to delay the rotting process, okay? <clears throat> but with tomatoes, if you live in Manhattan in your condo on the 50th floor, if you grow anything you eat, it's probably a tomato plant. So you know what they should taste like still. That's not true for a lot of fruits. If you've ever been to the tropics and eaten a banana off a banana plant, you know that the banana you get at Wegmans or anywhere looks nice, but it doesn't have any flavor. <clears throat> so we know what tomatoes should taste like. A lot of other fruits have also lost a lot of their quality potential, uh, and there's a lot of room for improvement. And again, it's really driven by this fact that we're constantly trying to uh, battle against this late maturation process that leads to decay. <clears throat> so we spend a lot of energy on transporting things fast, storing them in controlled environments, and 
Uh, we also use a lot of genetic resources. This is Henry Munger, a fellow alum uh, who uh, got his BS in 1936, his PhD in 1942, served on the faculty until he officially retired in 1981, but actually was very active here until just a few years before he passed away in 2010. He's responsible for the genetic systems that allow efficient carrot productions. He identified some of the important disease resistance in melons. He released many, many varieties of cucurbits, and he also worked a little bit on tomatoes. In the early 60s, in one of his greenhouses on campus, he found a spontaneous mutant, a mutant that didn't ripen. So it was easy to see, right? Hey, this plant here is not ripening at all. He called it ripening inhibitor. The fruit mature normally. The only real difference in the plant is that the fruit don't ripen at all. They just arrest prior to the ripening process. They also have large sepals on the flowers, so the, the, the leaf-like outer structures of the flowers are a lot bigger than normal. Otherwise, the plant looked pretty typical, except the fruit weren't ripe. There's not much use for that unless you like a lot of fried green tomatoes. Probably nobody likes that many. But what he found also, and many others have since uh, deployed, is the fact that if you've made a hybrid, if you crossed it with a, wild, with a normal tomato, you get a long shelf life, slow ripening tomato. And this is now in every commercial variety that you get in the supermarket. It's also the main reason that you can ship tomatoes all across the country, because you get an extra two weeks or so of shelf life. And it's also the main reason the tomatoes don't really taste as good as they used to because they're just not as fully ripe as they could be. Some of these can be pretty good if you leave them around for a little while. <coughs> okay, but again, this is a trait that is now in virtually every uh, fresh market, large-scale production variety, and even in a lot of the processing varieties because the delay in ripening, the lack of complete ripening, means that you get a more viscous sauce. The, there isn't as much breakdown of the cell walls. Our lab's interested in these mutants because just like when you're learning how your car works, you learn when it breaks down, right? And that's when you lift up the hood and you see what's wrong with it. So the mutants for us are a lot like that broken car learning experience, um, not always on the side of the road, fortunately. And our lab a number of years ago identified the gene that underlies this ripening mutation. And again, Look at the dramatic effect. A single gene isn't acting properly, and the fruit can't do it. It just stops the ripening process. It turns out it's what's whoops, called a transcription factor, uh, which is really a master switch. It's a regulator of other genes, genes that control the ripening process. And Julia Vrebolov in the lab isolated the gene, showed that she could put a normal gene back into the mutant and recover the ripening phenotype. And in fact, there's a second gene next to it that we call macrocalyx, that if you inhibit its expression, you get these very large sepals. So those two effects were due to two separate genes. We've looked at other species and found similar genes in many species. In fact, most fleshy fruits have a rin-like gene that functions in the ripening process. And these are actually transgenic, or popularly called GMO plants, where we with collaborators have shown that those genes affect ripening by re inhibiting their expression in strawberries, melons, and bananas. So in a diverse range of plants, this same gene function, suggesting it's something evolution has acquired a long time ago as a means of controlling the ripening process. Another example of a mutation that's bred into almost all your uh, typical tomatoes is a mutation called uniform ripening. So a typical tomato has this, when it's unripe, is kind of pale on the bottom, dark green on the top. And a mutation in the 1920s was identified, identified called uniform that results in a tomato that looks like the bottom of the fruit. It's light green. When that ripens, it ripens uniformly. A normal tomato, which you don't see many of these days, will actually have what's referred to as a green shoulder or sometimes a yellow or white patches on the top. Consumers tend to not like those, so they like this uniform mutation. In production fields, even for processing, the growers like it because it's easier to stage the whole field and say, now's the time to go in and harvest. Kong Wen, a graduate student in the lab uh, and a plant breeding student here at Cornell, who isolated the gene along with some collaborators at UC Davis 
and at the University of Valencia in Spain, showed that if you overexpress it, you can make a fruit that's basically the whole fruit's like now like the top. It's dark green. That was interesting. What was even more interesting was you could see here when they ripen, they get more red. So they have higher levels of beta carotene and lycopene. And what that tells us is that by selecting for this uniformity, we've actually reduced the nutritional quality of the fruit. And if you're, uh, again, an heirloom tomato person, a lot of people interested in heirlooms will look for that green shoulder phenotype as a sign of an old tomato variety because you don't see this so much in the modern varieties. And again, it's typically associated with better quality. Okay. I think I've kind of already stated why we use tomato. Uh, there's a lot of mutants. There's a lot of resources. You could put a seed in the ground, and three months you've got a ripe fruit. It's not like an apple tree, so it's much easier to use. It's actually closely related to a lot of other important species. Even coffee is not too distant a relative. And I, I better hurry up here and finish. So these are just a lot of the mutants that we've looked at and identified underlying genes, things like Rin, Uniform, High Pigment, which gives dark red fruit. If you've ever seen the Kumato tomatoes in the supermarket, this is a gene called Green Flesh basically results in the fruit ripening but not losing all its chlorophyll. So it's green and red at the same time, which if you ever got a green or red crayon when you're a kid, you get brown, right? Same mutation in the same gene in peppers gives you what are referred to as chocolate tomatoes. Uh, again, because of those two colors that are uh, co-mingling. And finally, uh, just to kind of end, uh, I'd just like to point out in tomato, and actually this has happened in many crops, there's a relatively narrow bit of that potential germplasm that's made it into production varieties. You know, even in South America, a lot of what's used now is what went to Europe and then came back. So there's a great deal of diversity that's still available from these varieties that potentially have a lot of useful traits, including uh, tolerance to stresses and even important fruit traits. We've been doing crosses, and others have as well, with these wild species. And this is just an example of a cross between a green-fruited tomato, one of the wild green types, little green marble, and a red uh, processing tomato. And you can see here some of the progeny of it. And one of the things you might notice, some of these are even more red than the cultivated parent. So from that green variety, there are characteristics coming in that actually elevate the redness of the resulting fruit. So there's a lot of potential for new traits and improvement that we can get out of these. So I'd just like to thank you for your attention. Um, I think we're going to do questions after both talks. Thanks. Well, thank you, Jim. Um, I feel like I need to make a disclaimer in that I'm not a biologist, I'm not a horticulturist, I'm uh, not a historian, um, but in the words of uh, Peter Sellers in that movie, Being There, where he was playing Chauncey, I'm just a gardener. So <laughs> that's where I'm coming from. And actually, Jim's uh, tomato talk reminded me of a garden story. Um, we always had a garden growing up, and um, one fall day after the first frost, my brother and I noticed there were lots of uh, tomatoes still in the garden. Uh, a lot of them were green, and so we started picking the green tomatoes and started having a little tomato war. And um, our mother caught on to this, and she came out wagging her finger and saying, those are good food, those are good food, you shouldn't be wasting those. Well, we had never had fried green tomatoes before in our house, but we did that night. Um, and that was the last time I had fried green tomatoes. <laughs> I'm going to give you a real whirlwind tour of um, a very important collection that we have here at Cornell, the Seed Nursery Catalog Collection, and some of our, uh, about our de digital um, <laughs> projects where we're collaboratively digitizing some of this material, and something we're calling the Purposeful Gaming Project. Can you repeat that? Purposeful Gaming. Purposeful Gaming, and I'll explain a little bit more about that later. So when many of us uh, see seed and nursery catalogs, or think about seed and nursery catalogs, I should say, we think about the really beautiful pictures that were in the catalogs starting in the 
uh, late 19th century and into the, into the early 20th century in particular. But those of us who are gardeners or perhaps historians, um, um, plant scientists are also very interested in the content, the, what is actually in those catalogs, what's the text, what are the pictures um, that represent the fruit. So here's an example of an early catalog from Vic. Um, anybody from the Rochester area familiar with a long uh, term seed nursery firm in Rochester called VIX? Well, here you will see VIX irondequoit melon. Now the irondequoit melon was a melon that was introduced in the 1890s by VIX and it was grown in the irondequoit area right outside of Rochester and sold in Rochester and it was very, very well received and unfortunately I covered up part of what I wanted to show um, but the price difference between VIX, Irondequoit and all the others was like four or five fold difference. It was just way, way more expensive than any of the others. So here is um, an example of a real important sort of historical note that we can find in catalogs. In the 1889 catalog, um, VIX represented it in color. That's almost good enough to eat. But there are also visual representations in there that were substantially exaggerated. Um, this is one of those um, from the Salser catalog. But we're here to talk about the Ethel Zoe Bailey Horticultural Catalog Collection, which is hosted by, it was within the Liberty Hyde Bailey Hortorium. So Liberty Hyde Bailey, the noted botanist and horticulturist here at Cornell for many, many years, um, started collecting these catalogs years and years ago. And for many years, um, it was his daughter, Ethel Zoe Bailey, um, who curated that collection. And here's a little bit of information about Ethel Zoe Bailey. Um, it's really amazing the number of years that she curated that collection. And on the previous slide, you may have noted that there's over 130,000 catalogs in that collection. She also uh, worked with her father um, in his botanical collecting trips. Uh, she also worked with him on many of his publications, co-authoring many of them, and she received some significant awards during her lifetime and really had her own distinguished career in botany and horticulture. So why did Bailey even collect seed and nursery catalogs? We think of them as quite ephemeral. They come over the winter. We enjoy sitting down and looking over them. Maybe by the wood stove, while it's really cold outside, we imagine what we can be growing when it gets warm. Um, why would a scientist, a horticulturist um, like Bailey collect them? Well, he did use them in many of his publications, and a couple of them are Hortus III, which is a listing of cultivated plants, and then also the Manual of Cultivated Plants, and the Annals of Horticulture. Now, the Annals of Horticulture was a publication that um, he put together, I think, five, six years, something like that, in the late 19th century. And he was basically summarizing the significant happenings um, in the field of horticulture for the, in, in essence, the previous year, summarizing the year. And the one section was Annals of Plants and what were the introductions. And in 1889, here he lists the Irondequoit melon from Vic was introduced in that year. So that was probably how he found out about it was because he had that substantial collection of catalogs that he could compile something like this Annals of Horticulture. So why would we want to digitize? Well, there's a lot of potential use. Um, I'm listing some of them here. So, oops. Um, taxonomists are very interested in when certain plants were introduced. Um, gardeners, particularly heirloom gardeners, very interested in some of the historical descriptions of, of varieties. Museums and botanical gardens want to recreate plantings from the period of the, the house or, or estate that they're working on. Great information for them. Plant breeders sometimes are looking for descriptions of plants with 
unique disease or pest resistance or other characteristics. Art historians, um, historians of printing, very interesting in the sense of how um, printing evolved and was uh, demonstrated in the history of catalogs. So this digitization project is actually uh, very collaborative. Um, these are the um, four major uh, institutions that are participating in this at this point. You can see that uh, Missouri Botanical Garden has a significant collection. National Ag Library has a very significant collection, as does Cornell. Uh, Missouri Botanical Garden doesn't have quite as large of a collection. In fact, they've, um, over the years, transferred some of their material to the um, Bailey collection. But they, in particular, in this case, were um, digitizing seed exchange lists, which were more frequently lists of, of plant material that could be exchanged between botanical gardens or other institutions like that. So these are the collaborators. And what we're doing is we're digitizing public domain American material for the most part. Uh, we started out by identifying um, our catalogs, firms that carried grapevines. We thought that was very relevant to our particular subject areas of interest. And it was made, um, we were off to a great start because Ethel Zoe Bailey actually indexed the individual varieties or cultivars listed in um, these catalogs for years, and there's an enormous car, uh, card file that uh, this material, this, this information is stored on. So once we digitize it, where does it go? Well, we're a member, Cornell is a member of the Biodiversity Heritage Library, which is a collaboration among about 20 botanical garden, natural history museum, and academic libraries. It's a very large collection at this point with um, over 45 million pages, 100 and, almost 160,000 volumes, and it is totally free and open access worldwide. Within that, we've created a sub-collection, and um, that is where we put all the seed nursery catalogs that are digitized by these separate groups. Now, I should point out I have some URLs here, but there should be a handout somewhere at some point that um, lists all the different URLs which you're welcome to take with you. So here's just a quick view of BHL, Biodiversity Heritage Library. Um, notice right here, there's a link to collections, and that's one way to get specifically to the seed and nursery catalog collection, so it's an alphabetical list of 42 sub-collections within BHL, and the seed and nursery catalogs um, are described there. This is at a browse page where you can see numbers. There's also an advanced search where you can go into to search the catalogs. Once you get to a catalog, this is how it looks within BHL. Um, this is a VIX catalog from I don't see the date offhand. I'd have to look at my notes. Um, but this allows you for navigation. You can page forward and back through this. You can enlarge it. You can make it smaller. You can download the whole thing or selected pages. And you have various ways to navigate here as well. So just a quick overview of the historical development. And this is very, um, very cursory, but give you an idea. So early catalogs were simply sheets of paper uh, with listings of seeds or listings of plant material that was available. And often, there would be price list price on there, but sometimes not. Then it went into little booklets that were only text only. Eventually, there were images added to the text, usually engraved or woodcut images. Sometimes those were hand colored then to add some color. Eventually, in the mid 19th century, lithography came along. And then eventually chromolithography. We moved then in the late 19th century and early 20th century into black and white. And then eventually color photography. And today, most every seed company has a website. But they are still producing print catalogs. I don't know about you, but we probably received 40 or 50 catalogs um, over this, uh, this past uh, catalog season. So very quickly, here is a broadside example. This is in our collection. It's actually part of the Lee Library at Geneva, uh, the experiment station in Geneva. This is a Prince catalog, one sheet um, from 1793. 
which is uh, Prince was one of the was considered the earliest commercial nursery in the U.S. This is an example now of a multi-page, where it becomes a little booklet, but again, it's only text. Eventually, illustrations started to be included in these texts. And I have some dates up there, but it, these dates sort of overlap with each other. It's not like one just stopped and another began. Sometimes those um, um, illustrations were hand colored. And then here we see on the left black and white lithography, and then on the right is color lithography. So you see we're starting to introduce substantially more um, interest and activity and color into the representations on the catalogs. And at first, the catalogs like this were usually had their color maybe on their front cover and their back cover, but not necessarily all the way through. And then in the early 20th century, you start seeing black and white photography showing up and eventually color photography. Now, seed nursery catalogs don't just have seed and nursery material. Um, Many of them saw the audience that was receiving those catalogs as having other interests, so they started adding other product lines. So this then shows that there is potential historic value to other um, interests as well as those that are interested in seed and plant material. So tools and farm equipment, beekeeping equipment, dairy equipment. Poultry and poultry supplies, and this is of personal interest to me because you can see there are some chicken waterers, and I have a personal collection of chicken waterers, so this has been very valuable for me to uh, document some of, um, some of mine. So purposeful gaming and BHL, what do we mean by purposeful gaming, and um, what is it all about? And BHL, that's the Biodiversity Heritage Library. So we're engaging the public in improving and enhancing discovery and access to digital texts. So this was a, a national leadership grant for libraries that was awarded to Missouri Botanical Garden in St. Louis. The partners are Harvard, New York Botanical Garden, and Cornell, and is funded by um, IMLS, the Institute for Museum and Library Services. So here's the problem that was, we're challenged with in this particular project. Full text searching of scanned text is significantly hampered by poor output of optical character recognition software. So when any publication, a book, a journal, a seed catalog, or whatever is digitized, it's really just a, a visual representation of that page. So until optical character recognition software is run against that page, um, that is not actually a searchable, the text is not searchable. So what this optical character recognition software does is looks at each representation of anything on the page and tries to see whether or not it is a character that's recognizable. And if it is, good. And it fortunately in many cases works very well. But in the case of historical literature in particular, there's a lot of variation in fonts, typesetting, layouts, there's ink bleed through, foxing, and other physical conditions that all inhibit the accuracy of OCRing the text. So how can we help improve that? Well, here's first of all an example. This is um, Species Planetarum, I believe, from the Linnaeus. Um, so here is a page of scanned text. And here is the OCR output. As you can see, there's a word or two that is recognizable there, but for the most part, it is not very recognizable. So it needs a lot of work. And part of that, if it was a really clean um, page that was just printed and crisp today, it would probably had close to 100% accuracy. But in something like this, the accuracy is really quite low. So how are we engaging the public? We are building an online game to crowdsource the correction of inaccurate OCR. So we're creating a game that will present the, the snippets from a page where the computer didn't recognize it was a word. It saw there was something there, but it didn't recognize it as being a word according to any dictionary that it was looking it up in. And so we take that page then and present it in front of the game player and try to make it fun 
for them to then key in what they see and then go from there. So the, um, another piece that we're doing is we're crowdsourcing the transcription. So if the whole page is really um, fairly inaccurate, if there's a certain threshold of inaccuracy on that page, why throw individual word phrases at the, at the user? Why not just show them the page and let them key in that page? And so there's crowdsourcing of transcription. And by crowdsourcing, we mean anybody out there can participate in that. Um, so we do it both for inaccurate OCRing, but also handwritten text, so field notes from biologists who are out in, and writing down in the field their, their notes those from, say, the 19th century working on um, Brewster, who was an ornithologist, um, we uh, put that handwritten text in front of the user, and the user can actually key that in, and then we have searchable text. And so another part of this project is where we are, uh, which is where Cornell comes in, is the seed nursery catalog digitization. Um, we're contributing, in a sense, another format of material. So what is in BHL now is primarily books and journal, journal articles, and that formatting and everything is fairly predictable and understandable. Um, in the case of seed nursery catalogs, the layouts are very different. Sometimes there's um, text laying over images and things like that, so it presents some new challenges for the uh, OCRing and the transcription. So here, is one of our prototype games. So we're in the help screen right now, so it's just giving some hints on what you can do and what you can't do. And you can go and see, if you've logged in, you can see what other people have scored and get your name to the top of the list. And then if you play, here is the snippet from the page. And here it's being keyed in. And hit enter. And this whole thing shook saying, oh, that didn't look right. Now that one was right, so we get a little more plant growth coming up. Next one gets keyed in. More plant growth. And as you can see at the top here, you're, uh, you're seeing how you're progressing. So this game is targeted for non-gamers. Um, so there are, <laughs> there are gamers out there who would find this a little too boring. Um, but we do have a second game called S'more Ball, uh, which is targeted toward gamers. And um, I'm not showing that today. Um, but we're thinking that this is more for those who would be interested in playing a game, um, are actually interested in knowing that this is benefiting the biological uh, community, the biodiversity community, um, because it's going to improve the searchability um, of the, the, um, the, the digital texts themselves. So what happens with the game output? Well, um, the game itself is being developed by a lab at Dartmouth called Tilt Factor. Um, and it's, the project is being led at Missouri Botanical Garden, so they can explain the background of this much better than I can. But in terms of if multiple players are entering the same character string for a given word, then the system would recognize it as being correct. So there's all sorts of algorithms and rules that go into that. And then that string of characters that was deemed correct, or that correct word, is then added to the index of BHL, which then makes it possible for that uh, searching to be improved and those words to actually be discovered on the page. So um, what I just showed you was actually a test version. Um, the game is not going to be released until Monday or Tuesday, rather, June 9th. Um, and that handout um, that is available does list um, the URLs for the games when they will come out next week, and you're welcome to try them. And here is just a snapshot of the s'more ball 
um, first screen there as well. So I've given you a whirlwind tour of uh, seed nursery catalogs, um, a little bit about our digital projects and purposeful gaming. And I'd like to thank my colleagues um, here at Cornell and elsewhere. And I'm open to questions, or we are open to questions. This has been a production of Cornell University Library.